All righty, we'll start in just a sec here. I'd like to wait till it turns to exactly seven o'clock. Give everyone a chance to get into the room. I mean, I never like showing up on time. And if I had the option to just roll up 10 seconds before, I would not be there 50 seconds before. Exactly, that's my, my thought. Oh yeah, the numbers are just going up and up. That's great. Yeah, that makes sense. All righty, so we will get started. So hello everyone, welcome. Um, this is our second of the spring journalism lecture series. We're gonna be having um, lectures pretty much every week. Uh, it'll be Tuesdays after this, yesterday's um, <clears throat> wellness day. Just a few things and then I'll introduce our speaker. I'm Will Yerman. I am the Norman Eberly professor. I have to actually read what I am. Professor of professional practice in the Donald P. Belisario College of Communications journalism department. Um, I'm gonna introduce our guest in just a second. I wanna thank the Eberlys um, whose generous donation to the college um, funds the professorship and funds uh, the, the lectures that we're having this week, as, as well as lots of other um, opportunities for students um, every semester. I'm very grateful for them. Um, and just to promote what we've got coming up over the next few weeks, we have a really interesting list of uh, speakers coming up. Next week, Andrew McGill, who's another Penn State alum, a journalism alum, is going to speak. He's the, um, he works for Politico, where he's on their interactive team. So he's going to talk about his work there. <coughs> Excuse me. If you've never been to a webinar different than a Zoom meeting, we can't see you. So you can sit back, take off your shoes, put on your pajamas, whatever you want. Um, if you have questions, there's a Q&A button and a chat button should be at the bottom of your screen. Drop in your questions and we'll either answer them as, as Dan goes along or we'll take them at the end after his presentation. Um, yeah, I think that's all the business. Our speaker tonight is Dan Victor, a graduate of our program. He is now a New York Times reporter based in London, and he's going to tell you about his experiences there and may mention the uh, cat video he um, wrote about um, just recently. If you haven't seen that, it went viral. It was pretty funny. Um, yeah, I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dan. Um, please drop in your questions as we go, and then we'll I'll come back at the end and we'll we'll help kind of go through those. So. So Dan, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you for being here. Really, really appreciate it. Yeah, it's great to be here. Um, well, I guess here is technically my apartment that I've been in for many, many months now. So it's not great to be here. I wish I wasn't here, um, but it is great to be doing this. We'll put it that way. Um, I uh, So as you said, I'm a Penn State alum myself. Um, I used to try to come back to campus as much as I could. Uh, partly just because it's nice to come back to campus, but also because I grew up in State College, so my parents and my dog are still there. I miss all three of them very much. Um, and uh, so I, let me start by just telling you a little bit about my journey, about how I got from there to here. Um, so I graduated from College of Com with a journalism major in 2006, uh, State High before that in 2002. Um, my first job at a college was at the uh, Patriot News in Harrisburg. I spent four years there as a reporter uh, doing a little bit of everything. So I did Cops and Courts, Hershey, Derry Township, um, presidential election was happening while I was there, uh, general assignment, features, pretty much everything, you name it, I did a little bit of it. Um, in those days, it was kind of the very beginning of uh, Twitter starting to first become a thing. and. When I first heard about it, I thought it was the most absurd thing I had ever heard of. Why would anybody ever want to use this thing? Nobody cares what I'm having for lunch, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, eventually I figured out ways to kind of incorporate it into my reporting um, and ended up finding some great sources and stories through it pretty early on. So that's what got me onto a kind of alternate career path that I didn't expect at the time where the next several jobs I had were focused almost entirely on social media. So. I went to a startup in DC called tbd.com that you surely have not heard of because we all got laid off after nine months. Uh, did not go very well. Um, I went from there to the Philadelphia Inquirer and then ProPublica, which is a investigative journalism nonprofit uh, before I started at the Times as a social media editor. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So I started there as a social media editor um, trying to figure out what the time should sound like on social media, um, how to incorporate reporting or incorporate social media into our reporting. And I had that role for uh, two years. Um, I got there in 2012, so I've been at the Times for eight years total now, but I was doing that role for two years before I moved into various other roles 
that turned into what I'm doing now, which is a reporter on what we call the express team, which is essentially general assignment. So um, once again, I'm doing a little bit of everything. Um, as you mentioned uh, yesterday, I was very happy to have written the uh, cat lawyer story, which was a very, very exciting day in my life. Uh, I got the cat lawyer on the phone. I was very proud of that. Um, I do uh, much more serious journalism as well, um, you know, explainers on the protests in Hong Kong and Belarus, serious breaking news around the world, whether it's terror attacks, shootings, uh, major weather events, coronavirus, all kinds of uh, mayhem. Uh, so I do a little bit of everything at the times and it's, it's been a lot of fun. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm happy to talk uh, more about the times later or career paths or anything like that. Um, but I did want to focus my main remarks here on social media, um, partly because, you know, you, you guys are hearing all the time about how important it is to use. Um, and I want to give you kind of more of a, a big picture look at it, as well as some more kind of specific pieces of advice that I can give you guys to take back. Um, but the uh, important thing for me is that it's used not just to kind of throw your stories out there to try to get traffic to your stories, but also how you can use it to produce great journalism while not going insane at the same time. Um, I do wanna acknowledge that uh, the way that I use social media is definitely gonna be different than the way that all of you guys use social media in a lot of ways, largely because it's different for everyone. Um, no two people really use social media in the same way. Um, we all have different personal identities. Um, we all have, um, you know, for me, I have this large platform through the New York Times um, and that really changes a lot about my experience personally. Um, but I want to make clear that I'm not really going to be talking about my experience too much. It's I'm trying to make points that will be much more universal. Um, you know, things that you, I don't want you to ever say like, oh, it's easy for you to say that the New York Times, right? Um, I'm hoping that what I'm talking about will apply to everybody. If I fail at that at any point, just knock, um, you know, let, call me out, say, hey, you know, let's let's bring this back here. I'm hopeful it doesn't come to that, but if that does happen and you don't feel like I'm speaking to you, just, just let me know. Um, <clears throat> so when we talk about social media, uh, I think a lot of times we talk, uh, we focus really on the negative, right? Uh, and all the ways that it's destroying our brains and changing our social lives and kind of true. Um, Certainly it does, definitely does have some destructive qualities, but I'll get to that later. Um, I think we need to start out with what's actually good about it, um, you know, why we're bothering with it uh, and, and why it's essential despite all the downsides, which we will go over. So if I had to make arguments for social media, uh, actually for it, um, I think I would start with imagining what things were like before social media came around. So if you're picturing whatever decade you want to picture, 80s, 90s, early 2000s, whatever it is. Um, you're picturing basically in any city or town in America, you've got a handful of newspapers, TV stations, radio stations, and this applies to both, you know, big national media and also local media, right? Um, these handful of media organizations are, are basically kind of gatekeepers uh, of what people in any community uh, is paying attention to. Um, you know, if, if the media wasn't covering something, it was hard to get anything to get discussed all that much or, or to get noticed inside the community. Um, so when you compare that to now, uh, instead of there being this kind of handful of all powerful media organizations, being able to use social media, not just journalists, but everybody in the community, it, it distributes this power to a lot more people. So. Uh, you know, a lot of these people who now have a little bit of ability to be heard uh, really weren't able to have that much influence before all this. So it makes it so much, a lot more people have access to this mass media and, and more broadly kind of mass attention, I guess I would say. And so many more people, when they need to make their voices heard, are, are able to be heard. Um, it's pretty good. That's, that's a great thing for, for society at large. Um, it can also serve as a safeguard for community if they're, you know, not getting the discussion that they think they need for whatever reason. Um, you know, in a worst case scenario, it could be because the, the journalists or a media organization, uh, they might be, you know, corrupt or single minded or, or um, you know, maybe they're, you know, exclusionary. Uh, maybe they uh, just simply have a newsroom that doesn't look anything like the community it covers. So maybe they don't even know that they're missing things whatever reason they have, um, those communities 
they now have this fail safe where people can say like, okay, so if the media isn't paying attention to this, I'll get attention to this on my own. I've got my own media, right? Um, the net overall effect of this basically just means that we have so many more voices, so many more perspectives that can make their way into the news media. And even if it doesn't, people can still access those voices on their own. Um, so yes, it means that the you know firmly established media is less powerful than it used to be, but I, I think that's a in my view, that's a pretty clear win for society at large. Um, so I think the most important way to think about this is in terms of the access that it gives, especially underrepresented groups. So I'm going to um, now attempt a technology thing and uh, figure out how to share my screen. So give me just one real quick moment here to uh, work this out. I think it should only take a moment. And here we go. Okay. Um, so I'm going to show you four stories that were all written within a couple months of each other back in 2018. Um, this first one, uh, many of you probably remember this one. It was two black men. They walked into a Starbucks in Philadelphia for a meeting. A uh, manager tried to kick them out, ended up calling the police on them after back and forth. Um, this led to a lot of protests, both in Philadelphia and nationwide, about how they were treated. The Starbucks CEO apologized, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, story number two, a couple months later, in this one, a woman noticed a group of Black women she didn't recognize exiting a home in her neighborhood, and uh, she assumed that the women were burglars, so she called the police. Uh, they were, in fact, just very, very lawful guests of an Airbnb, did nothing wrong. In this one, a uh, Black Yale student was napping in her dorm's common room, and uh, someone called the police on her for it. That's it. She was literally just napping. Uh, in this one, a Black student at Smith was reading uh, and eating lunch in a common room, and a student called the police because she, and this is a direct quote, seemed to be out of place. Um, so, all right, I'm going to go back to our view here. Um, so, not great. Um, I, I think, uh, oops, sorry, I'm get my tech to work out here. Great. Uh, so I imagine a lot of you, um, <clears throat> especially if any of you have had personal experience with anything like this, um, you may agree that there is nothing particularly new or extraordinary about any of these examples that I showed you. Um, like, great that the New York Times is covering it, sure, but also this has been happening essentially forever, right? Um, people usually say that, you know, these examples aren't haunting because they're outlandish outliers. It's because they're so completely routine. Um, but if you look at how these stories got started, it's not because any of the people involved called up the New York Times. And it's not even because they called up their local TV station or newspaper. Um, all these people describe their experience first and entirely on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Uh, and only after it got lots of attention online from other people, that's when the traditional news media picked it up. That's when the local media picked it up. That's when the New York Times wrote an article. So it just makes you wonder, you know, in, in the past, in, in that version of life where we don't have social media for people to, to go to immediately with these stories, would any of these people have called the media? We don't really know. And, and if they had called the media, would the media have done anything about it? Um, you know, I think we would like to think that maybe some would, um, but a lot of people, and especially people who haven't felt served by the media for generations, and that describes a lot of people, um, I think for a lot of them would say, absolutely not. No, that my story would have been ignored. Um, they would say, that's not a big enough story, or, or the, you don't care about my community. There are a lot of people who think that they just never would have had a chance to, to tell that story to, to anyone before social media was possible. Um, so now in, in the world that actually exists now, um, they, they don't have to leave it up to fate. They don't have to leave it up to anyone else's decision. They just describe their own experience and, and the people, the, the larger community kind of democratically decides that it's, it's worth people's attention. And they decide that with retweets and shares, right? Um, we, we've seen a similar thing with the Me Too movement um, in the way that you know, each individual story that has emerged through it kind of lends power to the one before and each individual story lends power to the ones that will come behind it. Um, it all just builds together. Um, I'm for sure very proud of the reporting that the New York Times did uh, on Harvey Weinstein. Um, 
along with the New Yorker and a couple stories that came before it, I think the, that journalism was a big part of starting the Me Too movement, but the Me Too movement was absolutely not contained within the pages of the New York Times, right? The, the Me Too movement was all about the discussion that happened afterwards based on the experiences of all these different individuals who were able to tell their stories and not necessarily through a newspaper, right? Um, we see a similar thing with police shootings where a, a bystander video shows a, a totally different version of events than the official police report. Um, you know, what, uh, on top of the larger issues in terms of, you know, what the videos allow us to see so much more of a visceral version of these events than we have in the past. Um, you know, the, these videos were, I mean, that's part of why they became so big on social media is because of the nature of these videos. Um, they allowed us to see, you know, Trayvon Martin and Eric Garner and Philando Castile and George Floyd and Alton Sterling. They, I mean, the, the names just go on and on and on. Um, so you, you're getting the point, right? All of these stories aren't starting from top down. They're starting down up. Um, to, to boil all that down, I just think it's crucial to remember at all times that, you know, without social media, you're losing the ability to amplify these voices that uh, have either been missed or ignored by the media in the past. And um, to think about it as an individual journalist, um, you need to be watching, you need to be seeing what's out there to make sure you're not missing those stories yourselves. So uh, part two of my social media is actually good speech um, or a pitch, I guess, is, is how much better it can make your sourcing as an individual journalist. Um, I think about in the past, and again, in that past world, uh, you know, I'm assigned a story by an editor who says, you know, hey, here's this new trend. Everyone's uh, balancing pickles on their noses. I don't know, but whatever. It's some dumb trend that everybody's doing. Um, so my editor says, hey, you know, find some people doing this, write about it. So uh, before social media, I have to go down my list of contacts of people I know, and, and I have to ask all of them, hey, do you know anybody who's balancing pickles on their noses, right? Um, and I have to hope that maybe they happen to know somebody. And uh, it just reinforces this problem that uh, the media often has where if you're only writing uh, about people one degree of separation from you, you're probably writing about people who are relatively similar to you in a lot of ways. Um, you're not necessarily capturing the whole world out there, which is an enormous world. Um, you know, I guess maybe you could walk through the, the lunch tables at the hub and try to talk to random people, you know excuse me, I'm a reporter at the New York Times. Do you balance pickles on your noses, right? Um, and you just go one by one by one, hoping to eventually find somebody. It's not the most efficient way to do it. And again, you're only gonna get people who happen to be at the hub at that specific time. Um, so now with social media, potentially anybody can have access to you, not just the people in your circle, not just people one degree away or people who you chance upon, but literally anybody in the world if things break the right way. Uh, an example is recently I wrote an article about uh, what it's like in lockdown for single people who live alone and about the specific challenges that they've faced that other people have not. Uh, and when I did this, I wanted a, a pretty wide range of, of single people to tell me about their perspectives. And uh, so I, I put out on Twitter, hey, I'm working on this story. Um, you know, I'm looking for people to talk to. Please let me know if this describes someone you know. And uh, because it got retweeted a couple other times, it got out of my immediate circle. I'm able to talk to people from Jerusalem and, and Portugal and London and Chicago and South Carolina and Texas and New York. And uh, again, this is one of those moments where, yes, it is different being at the New York Times, so I, I recognize that, but I do think that that can kind of happen at, at scale when you're working for the Daily Collegian or Onward State or, or whatever it is you guys are doing. Um, so my last selling point then for the value of social media would be um, a, a selfish one for you, um, you know, and how important it is for the careers of individual journalists, for, for you personally. Um, you've probably all heard by now that employers want to see you active on Twitter, uh, in a tough job market, you need everything you possibly can to stick out. Um, but even once you have the job, it, it still matters. You know, I, I mean, um, we had a, uh, a former columnist of the New York Times named David Carr. Uh, he apparently described his large Twitter following as the helicopter on the roof of the building in case things went wrong with the, with the Times. He'd be able to take all those people with him. Um, <clears throat> A good example of this is, uh, so I, I myself am a big Philadelphia 76ers basketball fan. Uh, and there was this guy named Derek Bodner who used to work for Philadelphia Magazine and did just a great job covering the team. He, he became my favorite beat reporter, really, really enjoyed his work. And uh, 
he ended up leaving the magazine, but he had uh, developed such a large following on Twitter that uh, he started a, it's called Patreon. Um, it's kind of similar to Substack now, if you've been following that. But essentially what it means is that his followers can pay him something like $4 a month. I don't remember the actual number, but something like $4 a month, you get exclusive access to his articles. So you don't need to work for a publication. You just are working one-on-one -on -one with your readers. Um, and because he had built such a large Twitter following, he was able to turn that into actual money. Um, he now works for The Athletic, so he does have a full-time job now, but it, was, it did show that there is a potential backup plan that you can have for yourself if you do have your own following. Um, and uh, having a backup plan is a pretty good idea to have at this point. So um, I think just finally, I would note that if you're, and I don't want to get too like woo-woo about the social media stuff, um, but I do think it is actually true that if you are following the right people, it really can expose you to new ideas. Uh, it can challenge your positions. It can open your mind to new perspectives. Uh, all this stuff is nutritional to the brain, and I really do think it does matter. So uh, that's all the positivity I've got. Finally, we're done with that. That was exhausting. I'm glad to be <laughs> away from that part of the speech. Um, I am half joking about that, um, but I do think we should talk about some of the pitfalls that you've uh, got to watch out for. Um, so the main one for me is the uh, the danger of echo chambers, um, where we think what we're looking at speaks for the entire internet. Um, no matter who you are, no matter how many interests you have, no matter your background, no matter you know how much you try to diversify who you follow, I promise whatever you're experiencing is a really tiny, tiny, tiny sliver of the entire internet. Um, it's just, it's so easy to forget that because we see what's in front of us and we see repetition so much that we think that everybody's seeing the same things that they are. And I assure you they're not. Um, and I think it's important because if we don't keep this in mind, it, it can really, really distort your sense of reality in, in ways that will either make your journalism worse or drive you insane, one of the two. Um, so I think it's it's a little easier to see this in, in really extreme cases, like if people go down the QAnon rabbit hole or, or some other kind of very specialized corner of the internet, um, I think it's easier to recognize that. Um, but it's important to understand that um, you don't have to go full QAnon for this thing kind of phenomenon to happen to you. It happens to some extent to every single one of us, like 100% of us, this is happening to to some degree. Um, it's just not representative of everyone. Whatever we are consuming just isn't. Um, and, and if you forget that, it can kind of make you think that there's more consensus on things than there, there actually is. Um, <clears throat> so what do I mean by this? That, that everything you're seeing is this like kind of little tiny itty bitty corner of the internet. Um, most importantly, I think it means that what you think everybody has seen is probably barely registered for most people. Um, you know, this applies to celebrities, this applies to memes, this applies to in-jokes. Um, you know, did you see this article? Like, everybody's seen this article. Not everybody has seen that article. Um, a decent example of this is I uh, mentioned earlier that yesterday I wrote that article about the lawyer cat, and I would be very willing to bet, very willing to bet that there are people on this call who heard me say that and said, what the hell is a lawyer cat? Right. Um, you know, for people who have been online in the past day or two, yeah, there's a pretty decent chance that you've seen Lawyer Cat, but there are also probably people here who went on a hike yesterday and, and uh, you know, just wasn't, didn't check out Twitter today and, um, you know, never checks out Facebook and just didn't happen to, you know, your friends don't really care about it on Facebook. So, yeah, while a lot of people know about Lawyer Cat, I, I'd be very, very willing to bet that there are people even here that do not. Um, and this happens all the time. Um, so when I write the story, um, I, I don't want to write it as, you know, for people like me who have spent the last three hours on Twitter watching the lawyer cat video and seeing other people like me sharing the lawyer cat video and other people writing about it, you know, analyzing it, whatever's going on. I'm writing for people who that didn't happen to. And again, this is a thing where the New York Times has this larger global audience um, but the exact same thing applies uh, on campus for whatever publications you're working for when you first start out in the journalism world. So th this is what I call Twitter brain, where you think that your Twitter feed represents reality much better than it actually does. Um, and, and I refer to Twitter, you know, obviously Twitter is not really the, the center of the social media world in some ways as much as it used to be. 
Um, but I do talk a little bit more about Twitter just because journalists tend to spend more time on there, um, partly because it's where more of the discussion is happening um, and there is a wide range of people that use it. Um, but even among that, it, it's still just kind of a drop in the bucket for the wider world. So um, I looked up some stats in 2019, which was, was excuse me, that was the most uh, recent Pew research poll. Uh, in 2019, just one in five Americans said that they use Twitter. Um, and among the people who use Twitter, just two in five actually use it daily. Uh, the people who do use it tend to be younger, they tend to be more highly educated, they tend to have higher incomes, they tend to vote democratic. Um, basically, they're all affluent millennials with just like a little pinch of Gen Z as well. Um, <clears throat> and even on top of that, a majority of tweets uh, that you do see uh, are coming from a pretty small number of users. Um, the median user, the, the middle Twitter user, tweets just twice a month. Uh, and 80% of the tweets come from the top percent, top 10 percent of, of tweeters. So, you know, if you were, let's say you are a football reporter at the Collegiate, and um, everyone tweeting at you as you're live tweeting the game is just screaming that Clifford has to be benched, right? And like if you're trying to figure out, do Penn State fans want Clifford benched? Um, I don't think you have enough information from that to know. It, it might be that Penn State fans want it benched, or it might be that the type of person who angrily tweets at a collegiate football beat reporter, maybe that group of people wants him, right? Um, it's it's two entirely different populations there. So in, in the end, in, instead of getting a representative cross-section of your audience, what you're really looking at is really a pretty homogenous group. Um, and it's a group that is a pretty small percentage of the population. And it's uh, even among that homogenous group, that's a small percentage of the population. Uh, most of the tweets are, that you're seeing are coming from an even smaller percentage of that group. So generally it just means that, yes, it can expose you to new voices for sure. Um, <clears throat> and for sure there, you know, it does have representation of a lot of different communities. Um, but I'd be really, really careful about extrapolating what you're seeing into any kind of broader trends. Um, and in terms of what the harm is of that, you know, no harm, no foul, I, I think there is some actual harm there. Um, three things. Number one, it, it leads you to, as a journalist, it leads you to think things uh, aren't stories because, you know, I see that everywhere. It's, it's really routine. That's not going to surprise people. It might surprise people. There are people who maybe aren't as knowledgeable about that thing as you might think if you're only looking at your own feed. Uh, number two, it might lead you to pass on stories um, because you think it's just not that big a deal. You barely see anybody talking about it. It might be that in communities that you're not a part of, people are talking about it. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And then number three, um, it can lead you to a, a certain false certainty in your thinking. Um, just an example, you know, I, I, I knew some 20 somethings in Brooklyn who were convinced during the Democratic primary, you know, oh, Bernie is definitely going to win. The polls are wrong because everybody I know is voting for Bernie. You know, all, all, everybody I see online is voting for Bernie. Everybody I, I see around Brooklyn is voting for Bernie. Um, you find yourself in this world where that, that makes a lot of sense, but it, obviously that's, that's not how things turned out. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So this is enough of a problem if you're just getting this kind of routine skewed version of the world. Um, but I want to shift, though, to kind of a more pernicious version of this, which is just straight up disinformation, uh, where bad actors are, are purposely trying to manipulate people. Um, and there is a difference between disinformation and misinformation. The way I usually think about it is misinformation is a mistake and disinformation is deception. I wish I could remember who I saw that from on Twitter. I would uh, gladly give them credit, but uh, yeah, that's that's just how I think about things. So I'm gonna do the tech thing again and uh, switch to my desktop and show you a image. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I, oh, here we go. Okay. Um, let me just, here we go, okay. So what we are looking at here, um, this image is taken from a uh, pro Beijing newspaper in Hong Kong from 2019, which is when I was there. Uh, this is during the big pro-democracy protests that were there, uh, which the mainland Chinese media was very strongly against. 
So um, let me show you what's going on here. Um, this part here translates as the foreign commander is updating the mob on social media about the police's latest actions, claiming there is still a distance between the police and the protesters, but now they are moving towards the next crossroads. So up here it says, and this is just the Facebook caption, CIA tourist, so concerned about where the police are. So this is very, very alarming for their readers. Um, you know, you can see the shares here, you know, I got 1.3 thousand reactions, 245 comments, 436 shares. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, it was very common in the mainland media to say the foreigners were secretly leading the protests instead of the Hong Kongers acting out of their own interests. So this would appear to be evidence that the Americans were secretly coordinating behind it, except for one little tiny problem, uh, which is that this man is not a CIA agent. And I know that for sure because he is actually an editor at the New York Times. And I sit a couple desks away from him. So I was very, very confident that he was not CIA or I would have overheard the conversations. Um, <clears throat> let me come back to the screen here. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, in addition to that, um, you could see it was kind of a blown up text message that he was sending. You could even see the name Ezra Chung, who if this newspaper would have bothered to even just Google his name or do any kind of search of his name, they would have seen that he was not texting protesters the location of the police. He was actually protesting a New York Times reporter. It was very, very easy to figure that out. So what we're seeing here is not just a simple mistake. Um, it's not misinformation. It's it's not a matter of, of different perspectives in a way that kind of a left-right issue might be in the US, right? Nobody's gonna say, you know, oh, well, some people think that this man is a CIA agent, but some people think that he is not a CIA agent. We, we don't know, right? It, it doesn't work that way. This is just very definitively saying things that are blatantly not true uh, without any measure at all to try to verify the facts. There's just zero debate possible on this. Um, unlike a lot of political arguments, this is just, simple facts and simple misinformation. So when I was in Hong Kong, you, you saw this phenomenon where there were people from Hong Kong who had uh, an open internet, could read whatever they wanted. Uh, they would see things completely differently than their friends and family on the mainland in China, where people there could only get their information from the, the heavily censored internet. Um, you, you, know, you would have uh, you know, the US, the UK, a lot of Western countries and Hong Kongers would they would generally see the protesters as these sympathetic figures fighting for democracy against a police force that had abused them. Uh, whereas most people in mainland China would see it completely differently. They would see them as spoiled kids, violent criminals, uh, you know, puppets of foreign powers, uh, some more complicated political stuff that I won't get into because we only have so much time. Um, but the, the point is that <clears throat> this echo chamber that, various people are in, uh, has just created a totally different reality, just completely separate from one another, where even the basic facts cannot be agreed upon. So this is a pretty extreme example uh, of the echo chamber um, because of the way that China very strictly controls the internet inside its own borders. But I don't want you to think that it can only happen in an extreme case like this. Um, instead to think about you know, the, the little tiny ways that the same patterns kind of emerge in our own media diets, in our own social media diets, in our own friendship bubbles, whatever it is, the, the information that we're surrounding ourselves with. It doesn't take outright censorship by the government to, to kind of narrow your field of vision. We're, we're already narrowing our own fields of vision all the time, um, to some extent at least, and, and that's impossible to avoid no matter how hard you try. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, finally, I want to, um, talk a little bit about mental health. Um, I think that if we are not careful, um, this can really have a destructive effect on us. Um, not just the, the misinformation, disinformation, um, but just the, the constant saturation of social media, the, the way that we use it. Um, you know, some people feel very uneasy when they see, um, you know, people living their lives on, on Instagram and TikTok. Um, other times it's all of the, the negativity that we're surrounded with uh, on Twitter. Um, whatever it is, um, 
it's not something that people are great at talking about openly quite often. And so I just want to uh, take the opportunity to state very, very clearly um, for anyone who might need to hear that it is okay to prioritize your mental health. I, I think sometimes that gets skipped in these conversations. And I, I just think it's very important that you, you do consider what you need to do. Um, so I, I wanna show you a tweet um, that is unfortunately, in my opinion, kind of representative of uh, a common experience for journalists. It is not this one, it is this one. Oh, oh wait, don't look at that yet. Okay, this one, all right. Um, <clears throat> so this is a, uh, a uh, bookseller uh, in the UK. Uh, Olivia says, I made a community library. If you're in the Bishopston area of Bristol, please feel free to visit, borrow, swap out, and enjoy some much needed escapism. So she made a cute little bookshelf there, lets people take the books, very cute. Thing that nobody could possibly get mad at uh, until people got mad at it. It's not a library, it's a book swap, it's not a library, blah, blah, blah. Whatever, Leon is just not a fan of this at all. Um, stick a few books in a box and call it a community library. This is a really middle-class thing to do with no real understanding of collection management or the role of libraries as a placemaker in the local community. Let me know when you're going to introduce computers. One out of three, he had two more of these to go. And finally, if one day you are thrown in the back of a Jeep or a dust cart instead of an ambulance, you might wish you had cared more about preserving our glorious public services, had understood, had shaken off your complacency, and had done your best to save them. So take that, Olivia. How dare you put those books outside your place? Um, unfortunately, that is um, a bit of a uh, common thing in that uh, yeah, we're uh, going to deal with some unwarranted negativity sometimes. Um, if you're not careful, you can find yourself in this kind of inescapable cycle of negativity, constant doomsdaying, um, because the, you know, the news is depressing. The news is really, really pretty depressing sometimes. Uh, and being angry about things is a major part of how we communicate on social media. That's just kind of how it's always been. Um, so some of it, you know, like this example with the library is almost, excuse me, is, is so absurd as to be laughable, right? Um, in, in some ways, that's kind of the, if you're gonna get a weird response, it's kind of the best kind because at least it's, it's easier to laugh off. Uh, for me personally, my rule is that you, you kind of have to earn the right to hurt, to hurt me, to harm me. Um, you know, if you're clearly just lashing out it, it, without putting much thought into it, I, I'm not gonna take that criticism too seriously. But if you made a good point or if it's from someone calm headed or someone I respect, I'm gonna take that criticism very seriously. I, I'm fairly thin skinned, unfortunately, and I'll probably be in the fetal position for like three days if that criticism comes from someone I respect or someone making a good point. Um, so it's a little easier to laugh it off when it's just completely absurd. Um, but other times, unfortunately, and, and uh, this is especially true for women and, and people of color, uh, it can work its way into threatening and, and abusive. Um, and it's really, really not fun to read or, or to be a part of. And um, if that happens to you, you know, there's a, there's a lot written on the internet about, out, about how to handle that. And I think that might be a better resource for you, but I would suggest reaching out to people. Don't do that alone, um, whether it's a professor, whether that is a, a, a teacher, a, a friend or, or a journalist online. Um, you know, this, once you get into the working world, there's a decent chance that some degree of this could happen to you. It can also happen to you now, you know, like it, sometimes your tweet will go viral and all of a sudden people you never expected to be in your mentions are somehow in your mentions being really, really rude about it. Um, so uh, just know that if that does happen to you, that you wouldn't be alone, that there are other people who have been through that experience who, who would be able to help you. So a certain amount of this is unavoidable. Um, I mean, you can't really be a human who follows the news and, and get away from things that make you sad. Um, and unfortunately, there are going to be bad people in the world who will be in your mention sometimes with stuff like that. Um, but I would just suggest that you be on the lookout for maybe when your dosage is just a little bit too high. Um, and if it does, don't be afraid to pull back. Uh, I mean, this may seem elementary, but I, I just don't think it's said enough that you just got to do what's, what's healthy for you. Um, you know, that might mean tweeting a little bit less than you did before, even if, you know, I'm saying you need to do it to help get a job or, or all your professors are saying that. If that's what you got to do, that's what you got to do. And that's the right decision for you. Um, it, it could be setting limits on, on how often you check social media. Um, I know for me personally, when I went to Hong Kong, because we had a 12 hour time difference, 
America was asleep most of the time that I was awake. And so I actually just didn't get as much social media in my life as I used to. And I just felt so much healthier. And it made me think like, man, when I move back to America someday, I could just do that. I could just not check social media and then just check it once or twice at the end of the night. And I wouldn't really miss that much. And it does make you realize that a lot of it is a choice, how much we are deciding to consume. Um, the bottom line for me is that social media should feel like somewhere between a, a positive for your life at, at best. And at worst, it should be like kind of an annoyance, like, oh my God, but it shouldn't feel like an anchor, right? You know, if it feels like an anchor to you, I would definitely just encourage you to think about how you might change your habits. Um, I have a friend named Karen Ho who uh, tweets a daily reminder to people to stop doom scrolling uh, when you just keep scrolling and keep getting mad about everything that you see. And um, at some point, you just got to stop. Um, you just say, I've seen enough negative things for now, and that, that's enough. So uh, that is what I've got so far. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions. Um, sorry for rambling so long. Um, I am happy to talk about whatever you feel like. Uh, my career path, uh, career advice that I may have, what it was like in Hong Kong, what it's like working for the New York Times, past of social media, future of social media, my favorite color, Penn State football, whatever you want to talk about, I I'm here for it. Um, so Will, if you can come back, are you going to uh, help with that? Yeah, I can I can sort of moderate that. So we have a couple of questions already. <clears throat> Drop in more if you've got them. I'm going to use my role and ask a couple first. That's my privilege. Um, sure. I, I was curious of a couple of things that you said. You talked briefly about the good side of social media, but you talked about the sort of democratization of it and how everyone has a voice. And, and your career sort of spans the, the kind of the real growth of social media and Twitter. How do you think that's changed the role of mainstream journalism? Like how does the Times think about its role and responsibility when everyone can tell a story um, and people are less likely to come to the Times or to you know other kinds of authorities of, of media? Yeah, so uh, number one, I would say, I, I don't think that people are less likely to come to the Times. Um, I mean, our, our, our traffic numbers are still great. Our subscription numbers are still great. I think there is absolutely value in the kind of traditional journalism that we do and that a lot of places are still doing. Um, now, so the, the elimination of the mainstream or the, the large media as the only gatekeeper does not mean that they've you know lost their purpose. I, I think that purpose has shifted somewhat. Um, you know, let, let's say you um, see some kind of rumors emerging on social media, you see a viral video, a lot of people still don't really know what to believe. There's so much misinformation out there. There's so much crap out there, to be frank. Um, and people, a lot of times, I, I see the comment quite often, like, I won't believe this until I see it in the New York Times. So uh, for me, especially as someone who writes about viral news a lot, um, I, I do write these kind of goofy stories sometimes where you see something, you know, some meme that's going big, <clears throat> some video that everybody's responding to. And uh, I'm always very skeptical of them. And I always, um, and this is one of my favorite pieces of advice for reporters is you always assume that what you're looking at is fake or wrong or made up until proven otherwise. I think a lot of times our initial reaction is, oh, this is awesome. And then you wait for proof that it's fake before you don't believe it. But you kind of kind of flip that where you assume it's fake until somebody proves that it's real. So for me, I think that's a major role uh, of a news organization um, and individual journalists. This is something that people can do starting right now um, is to take that viral story and try to talk to the people behind it, find out what the story was. So yesterday with that lawyer cat, I get the lawyer on the phone and say, hey, what kind of case were you, uh, were you talking about? What court was this in, et cetera, et cetera. <clears> that serves two purposes. Number one, it makes it a fuller story. Uh, number two, it also confirms that this is not some kind of hoax. And that has happened more times than I can tell you. Um, I, I've had people get in touch with me about stories, viral stories. And as I ask them more and more questions, it becomes very apparent that they were lying to me, that it's just for the lulls, right? Like they, they truly think that I'm not going to investigate that far because quite frankly, a lot of places don't investigate that far. So for me, I just, I think there's a very important role uh, in still doing this kind of basic vetting, the traditional reporting that we've always done. 
Excellent. One more question for me, and then we've got <clears throat> questions coming in. You talked about the echo chamber, and, and I know I fall for that all the time. I think what I'm seeing is what the world is seeing. As a, as a journalist, how do you take care to make sure that you're not just seeing your slice of the world and to make sure that you're getting a fuller view, both in terms of how you cover social media specifically, but then also as a reporter, how do you know what the real world is thinking? Yeah, um, so uh, I, I guess the short answer is you never know. Um, you know, you, there are things that you can do to broaden your horizons, but there's never, you know, I, I <clears throat> unless you can commission a, a scientific poll, excuse me, which uh, even then I think we see that there are limitations of that if you've watched the last couple presidential elections. Um, but I think in terms of what you can do, specific steps um, is, is really to just make an effort in thinking about who you're following. Um, and I don't just mean, you know, follow people from the opposite side of the political spectrum of you that are just going to make you angry all the time. You know, if, if you're a liberal, I'm not saying follow Rush Limbaugh. If you're conservative, I'm not saying, you know, labor over every word AOC says, you know, I, I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that there are um, ways to expand whatever your circle is at the moment with reasonable people and reasonable ways. Not that those people are unreasonable. I didn't mean to say that, um, but you, you know what I mean, right? There, there are ways that you can uh, slowly expand your circle. Um, for me, I always try to make sure that, uh, you know, I, I'm reading specific authors who have focuses on things that I may not think too much about. You know, I'm making sure that, like, yeah, I like sports and video games, um, but, you know, I, I'm making sure I follow people who do book reviews and, you know, magazine writers and, and feminist writers and, uh, you know, like a little bit of everything, right, mm -hmm. is all I'm trying to say. So um, trying to just expand that um, and beyond that, I think it's just more just the being able to recognize that you have a limited view uh, kind of prevents most of that damage from happening. You kind of have to accept that you're never gonna get the full view, but you just wanna make sure that you're not screwing yourself up because of the lack of it. Good advice, all right, thank you for that. So let me go to the questions. We have a let's go <clears throat> sisters, that's just a comment. I'll throw that out there. Um, Let's see, first question is, how do you feel that political figures over the past decade using social media has influenced journalism? That's a good question. Um, I, I think that um, it's been fascinating in a lot of ways. Um, one thing is that, <clears throat> you know, they, if you're a political figure, you don't need to go through the press um, to, to get your points out there. Um, in some ways that has been great for political candidates in that they can speak directly to their supporters. Um, they can get into these communities where their ideas are gonna be received well. Um, and frankly, they, you know, the media is not immune to screw ups. The media have screwed up their stories sometimes. So uh, I think some people are of course upset about that as they should be. Um, the flip side of that, of course, is that when it's not filtered through the media or, or is not, you know, going through the reporting process, some lies can slip in, some uh, mistruths can slip in, some missing context can slip in, and uh, there's no way to be able to present that. And so uh, when people start to feel like, oh, I can go directly to my uh, candidate and I don't need to go through the media, uh, that kind of lends itself to this echo chamber effect, right? Where you're, you're never going to see this information that uh, could change potentially how you feel about this. Um, so I, I think in some ways it has uh, led to a more informed electorate, but in some way it, it does raise some concerns as well. Do you think newspapers or you or the Times have changed the way they write about some of that, like the tone? Um... I mean, I think specifically about, you know, now former President Trump and how controversial he was with his tweets. Did, did that then push journalism to respond more extremely? Like, is that, do you think the style of writing or reporting has changed? Yeah, I mean, to, to some extent. Um, I, and I should say that I, I'm not too closely involved with the politics coverage, so I, I'm probably not too knowledgeable about the, the ins and outs of our, our, our Trump coverage. Um, but what I would say is that, um, you know, Trump was, was certainly a different case in terms of how he uses Twitter versus most politicians, of course. Um, I think there was some, um, let's see, how do I put it? Sorry, it's uh, almost 1 a.m. here, so my brain is only slightly working, so I may be not as fast as I normally would be. Um, 
Sorry, my brain lost the question. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's totally fine. I was just wondering if, if the way politicians are using um, Twitter and sort of the extreme ways, and I don't think it's just Trump, but you know, I think that has spread to lots of politicians, has changed, has sort of demanded a change from the way reporters then report about it. And I know that's not your beat exactly, but I just wonder what your take on was on. That. Oh yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, I, I think uh, it got to the point uh, with Trump where you just simply can't write about every single tweet. Um, you know, I, I think at the very beginning, it was so out of the ordinary um, that a lot of them were creating news. And then as time went on, I guess fewer and fewer of them made news, fewer and fewer of them broke new ground, right? Um, all right, <clears throat> moving down the list here. So Kurt Chandler, uh, who you know, wrote, writes, asks, with your obvious expertise in using social media as a reporting tool, how do you keep from being pigeonholed as being sort of the social media reporter while still being able to write about serendipitous events like um, Instagram egg, which I'm not familiar with, and lawyer cat? Um, I'll just quickly explain the Instagram egg um, <clears throat> because Kurt has a very good memory. Uh, at one point, there was this egg that showed up on Instagram, and uh, nobody really knew what was going on with it. But then just everybody just started liking it, and uh, it became this strange mystery. Why is everybody liking this? It's now approaching the record. Okay, this beat Kylie Jenner for the record, uh, and nobody knew what it was. And of course, it ended up being a you know freaking marketing campaign or something. Um, but it was just a kind of fun, goofy internet story. Um, to, to Kurt's point about not being pigeonholed, um, the specific role that I'm in um, kind of lends itself to, um, I, I call it a, a, a lowbrow, highbrow mix, where one day I'm writing about the Instagram egg and the next day I'm writing about protests in Belarus. Um, so for my specific, I, I would say that I am a little sensitive to that myself because um, I do, I love animal stories. I love goofy, weird animal stories. Um, but a lot of journalists are worried that they won't be taken seriously when they write the Belarus explainer if they do that. Um, to me, I think it just kind of exercises both parts of the brain. Um, and I would encourage the students here, um, if you're in a position where you do find yourself starting to feel a little pigeonholed, it's just like, oh, the young, like, internet trending reporter, like, oh, she's gonna write about the memes, right? Um, if you are feeling that way, um, you know, really making an effort to show that you, you do have range. Um, and there's not necessarily any problem with just covering internet culture. I think internet culture is a hugely significant beat. Um, we have a reporter at the Times, Taylor Lorenz, who has just done an unbelievable job showing the business of influencers um, and, and how it's just a, a major, major industry now that affects so much of our culture. Uh, so I, I, I don't think that there is any shame in covering internet culture, um, but I do think that um, if that's not something that you do wanna be pigeonholed as, that um, you know, take it upon yourself to, to try to expand your range as much as your editors will let you. Excellent. What's next? <clears throat> what was your favorite and then worst part of working in Hong Kong? Um, the weather is way, way better in Hong Kong. I hate the winter. Um, you know, I grew up in State College, so you guys get it. Um, it's very warm there and there are beaches everywhere. It's wonderful. Um, but you asked about working there, so not living there. Um, you know, I, I think, so I moved in uh, 2018 before the protest started. And uh, the protest started about six to eight months into my time there. Um, and it was just extraordinary being there for it. Um, as a journalist, uh, just such a fascinating story. Um, it, it did mean at times going down onto the streets and, uh, you know, putting on the gas mask and the goggles and getting, a, I, I didn't get a lot of tear gas. I, I got a little, little tiny bit of tear gas enough that I can say I got tear gas, but I didn't really get the full on, like, I feel like I'm going to die experience that a lot of people did. Um, but it, it is, uh, it was an endlessly fascinating story that I'm so glad I got to be there for, both being out on the streets and constantly talking to Hong Kongers about what it meant to them and uh, the experience that they had of that. Um, so that would be my favorite parts. Um, the worst part, um, <clears throat> I guess I would, uh, it, it, I, I would see a lot of stories that required foreign language skills and, and that was very frustrating to me and that I, I really wanted to, to write the story out of Korea, um, but I, I don't speak the language so I can't. 
um, that I often felt like I was running into roadblocks there a lot because of that. Um, we, I, I was extremely privileged to be at the times where we might be able to have somebody who works in South Korea who um, say, hey, can you translate this webpage for me or whatever it might be. Um, but most people probably aren't, aren't going to have that luxury. So uh, yeah, that, that could be a little frustrating. Yeah, I think not knowing the language is a big barrier to, but but beaches and warm weather seem like yeah, worth, I, worth it all. I, um, I have those in London. <laughs> um, so you touched a little <laughs> bit on this next question, but I think it's a, it's a really good one. Um, when you're talking about misinformation, disinformation, as well as then stories going viral, how do you verify a story before publishing? What, what are the steps to make sure it's true? Um, as this person points out, obviously lots of stories go out that are not true at all, so. Yeah, thank you for asking that, asking that question. That's a really, really good question. Um, essentially, it's, it's you know, the same standards that you would apply to literally any other story. I think sometimes we have this temptation to, uh, I guess, lower our standards just because it's an internet story, you know, oh, well, everybody was talking about it. Oh, and then a week later, like, well, it turns out it wasn't true, but everybody got a good laugh out of it. Um, I think we certainly have the standards that we, we don't want to do that. Um, so I'll, I'll do things like I will, uh, I always try to get somebody on the phone to explain to me exactly what happened, get the backstory of it. Um, an important concept to me is, especially when it's a viral video, um, a lot of times they are either intentionally selectively edited to leave out the context that would show that it was actually a different thing. You know, if somebody's trying to make a political point, then uh, they may cut it off at a very specific point. Um, sometimes it's just, it happens to be cut off in a way that changes the meaning. Um, so it's very, very important to me to ask what happened immediately before this video and immediately after this video. Um, I sometimes will ask, you know, can you send the full footage to me? So I can see that, or I'll just ask them to describe what happened. Um, it's a really, really important part of having that context. You know, it, you know, seeing somebody walk up and sucker punch somebody would look awful until you find out that, um, you know, right before the video was cut off, the other guy sucker punched in, right? So it, there's all sorts of ways that this can go wrong. And, and it happens all the time, as you point out. Um, so getting people on the phone, going through the normal reporting process, asking them questions, ask them to produce documents, ask them, you know, like, hey, okay, so, um, oh, a classic one would be um, <clears throat> anytime there is any kind of major shooting in the U.S., there will be Twitter trolls who will change their location to the spot and say, oh my god, I was in the mall, I can't believe this happened, right, and so then their tweet will get embedded onto all these major news sites, and then they change their display name to, like, LOL, pwned, you know, stuff like that, right? So uh, one thing I'll do is when I see any of these, I always scroll back through tweets um, looking for, okay, so this person says he lives in Minneapolis, uh, but all of his recent tweets were about uh, Las Vegas, right? Or, oh, this person clearly has been going to bars in Clearwater for the last, you know, eight weeks. Uh, so no, I don't believe that this guy is from Minneapolis. Um, uh, you know, if somebody says that they were at a place, I say, okay, can you send me any other photos of those? Like, how many people do you know only take one photo and then boom, they're done? Like, oh, I guess that's the one, right? So um, just, you know, again, going back to my uh, concept earlier that I mentioned of just assuming everything is fake and wrong until it's proven right, I think applying that standard to viral news is crucial. Those, are, I mean, those are really simple but important things. <clears throat> Wanting to see the whole video to understand what happened before or after seems, and it's not always available, but you have to ask. Yeah, yeah, no, and those are you know basic kinds of reporting, but easy mm -hmm. to forget to do that. Um, so we have a bunch of questions all of a sudden, so I'll try and go through these. Um, right. What made you decide to go into journalism? How did you start out? Uh, I went into journalism for the same reason that anybody does anything, which is that I was trying to impress a girl. Um, There's a really cute girl in my high school journalism class, and uh, yeah, I wasn't going to do it the next year, but then she said, so you're going to do it next year, right? And I said, yeah, of course I'm going to do it next year. And, you know, journalism's the lifeblood of democracy. Let's, let's do this, right? Um, so that, that got me into it in high school at State High. Uh, shout out the Lions Digest, if any of you are, are my fellow townies. Um, 
so I, I got into it in high school. And then uh, when I got to Penn State, I, you know, enjoyed the, the lovely College of Comm. Um, and I just kind of, you know, it, it got its hooks in me and it never got rid of me. Have you thanked her? Would you stay in touch with her? I have, yeah, we're still friends. Yeah. Good, 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 good. Um, uh, Katie O'Toole, you may remember, asks, mm -hmm. how have you adapted your reporting during COVID? What's changed for you? Well, I'm, I'm uh, spending all my time in my apartment or, well, since I live in London, my flat, I guess I should say. Um, I, uh, so it first happened, uh, I was in Hong Kong when, it, you know, COVID, of course, started in Hong Kong before it got to the West. Um, I uh, first, I think, started staying, uh, working from home in March after I had a, a COVID scare where one of my friends got it. Um, you know, the uh, IT person at the time brought the monitor over to my apartments and I just kind of set up from home there. And uh, yeah, the, the office hasn't reopened since then. Um, you know, we're hoping that maybe we can go back into the office this fall. Um, UK is doing well with the vaccine, so who knows, but um, generally I, I'm just set up here. I've got my external monitors behind me that I, I can't show you at the moment. Um, and we are uh, using Slack a lot more to communicate with coworkers. We're doing a lot of these Zoom hangouts like everybody. Um, I, I think there are a lot of reporters at the times who, I, I, I tend to be more desk bound than most reporters, um, but for the ones who are out in the community more, um, they have gotten warnings that they probably should cut out unnecessary trips. So hanging out at home even more than I was before. All of us, yeah. Hopefully, yeah. That, yeah. Someday we'll look back on this and okay. whatever we'll do when we look back on it. Um, so we're at about eight o'clock, but if you don't mind, we'll go <clears throat> for extra minutes. Yeah, I'm, 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 well I could go all night. Time. Let's do it. <laughs> all right. Uh, let's see, I'm catching up here. Because social media... Um, is such an open forum for discussion and opinion, do you find it difficult to navigate through a space where opinion often rules over fact? And as an objective journalist, how do you walk the line of expressing or withholding your own opinions with an online audience? Yeah, that's a good question. It's a, it's a complicated, very, very difficult one. That's kind of the core of what everybody's trying to figure out right now, right? Um, it, this depends a lot on where you work and the attitudes of, of any specific place. I, I think the New York Times certainly is a, a more on the traditional side in terms of a division between news and opinion. Um, there are also a lot of places that you all will be applying for jobs that will not want that distinction, that will want your work to be more imbued with, uh, with not just opinion, but with mission, uh, with moral force, right? Um, and I don't think that one goal is more noble than the other, um, but just kind of depends on, on what your specific thing is. Um, for me, as, as you said, Lily, about um, being more kind of on the objective side, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I, I do think there is value in withholding my personal political opinions. Um, I, I think that there are certain red lines there. You know, I, I wouldn't, um, you know, both sides, the idea of racism or sexism, something like that, right? Um, and the, the trick then is saying like, well, obviously, if racism is a red line, then what else is a red line? Um, you know, I, I wouldn't say, oh, everybody go out and vote for the Democratic politician or the Republican politician. Um, but, you know, would you say, hey, I think that women should make the same amount as men? You know, you know, what is a, a political opinion? What is not? Um, it, it, it can be difficult, um, and especially when it comes to matters of personal identity. Um, so I, I would just say, you know, it, I try to veer on the side of caution. Um, I just don't really, you know, if I have to debate whether or not I should send that tweet, I shouldn't send that tweet. Um, there isn't much to be lost by not tweeting. Um, so I, I think it's just um, thinking about, you know, would a, a reasonable minded reader, and I'm not talking about the people on either wings, I, I'm talking about the people in, in who are reasonable, who just want fair minded journalism, would they see this tweet and question anything that I've written? And, and if that, you know, fair-minded person might question that, then I think it, it just, it, I'm better off just withholding it. Sort of a related question, I guess, is how do you think journalists should be using social media to advance their career? So beyond reporting, just as a way to, I don't know, find jobs, make a name for yourself. Mm -hmm. yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so I, 
like I said earlier, I, I do think it is really important in terms of your own personal development and, and completely selfishly now, not for the news organization, just for you. Um, I, I do think that, um, you know, it, it's not simply just tweeting out your articles, right? Um, I, I think the main thing when you're trying to build an audience is just being a real person. Um, you know, the we have this tendency when you're working as a journalist, especially if like me, you're working for a more kind of traditional place to, you know, really do a stiff collar and say, you know, and, you know, just this really kind of stuffy, boring, just real boring voice that we tend to have on social media sometimes. Um, and I really encourage you not to do that. Um, I mean, it, obviously there are lines to, you know, you don't want to get too much into, you know, TMI or, or um, you know, oversharing, um, but there is a lot, you know, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a Sixers fan and I'm going to tweet about the Sixers, even though that's not what I'm covering. Um, if I have just some dumb joke that comes into mind, or I want to make some awful pun based on whatever headline is at the moment, that's fine. Right. I, I think the more you become well-rounded as an actual person, the more people likely people are to, to follow you. And this also applies to uh, your tweeting when you are on the job. Um, I, I think a great example is the all the live tweeting that happens during the Penn State football games. Like I, I, I follow a bunch of writers for the Collegian and, and Onward State and others. And, and I, I'm not speaking to any current people, of course, um, but just throughout all the years, you can tell <clears throat> some of the reporters who kind of understand instinctively that football is supposed to be fun. So sometimes you'll have people tweeting, Christian Hackenberg has passed to Gino Lewis and they have successfully completed the touchdown, period, right? Um, whereas another reporter says, oh my freaking God, did you see that unbelievable catch? 18 exclamation points, right? And that's how people perceive a football game. You know, that's how people are consuming it. And so it makes much more sense to just like use the voice that other people are using. So um, with that as an example, um, just be a real person, have personality, but also know where the line is where you're, you're not going to just, um, you know, get yourself in trouble. I, I, I think just real quickly, one more thing I would add is that, um, you know, Employers do want to see that you can build a following, that you can describe a story well on Twitter. These are all good things. Um, but more than anything, employers just want to see you demonstrate good judgment. And Twitter is nothing if not an opportunity to show bad judgment. And, you know, 99 good judgments and one bad judgment is, you know, they're going to remember the one bad judgment. So it's really an opportunity to just like show over and over and over again, like, yes, I made the right call on this. Do you have a personal rule, like you pause before you hit send or something to keep yourself from making that one bad? Yeah, tweet, like, you... basically, if I have to debate sending that tweet, I do not send the tweet. That seems like a, a really good rule. Um, all right, a couple more questions. What are your tips for creating, maintaining, well, you talked about some of this, maintaining a social presence that's genuine, also professional. I think we sort of touched <clears throat> on that, but... Um, I mean, I do think building a following, being natural, mm -hmm. right, to sort of yeah. create a voice for yourself. How did you yeah, break yeah. into international reporting? What tips do you have for people who aspire to be an international reporter? Oh, that's a good report. A uh, good question. Um, I, again, as is often the case in my career, I, I totally lucked into it. Um, it is not exactly what I intended to happen. Um, for me, I, I became part of this express team uh, in New York, uh, where I was doing this general assignment reporting, uh, and they realized that they had a need for somebody in Hong Kong, um, not necessarily because it was in Hong Kong, um, but because that's where our main base is in Asia, and uh, they just wanted somebody who would have the kind of 12-hour time zone difference, so I'd be able to spot a story that was happening, be able to write it, uh, and it's done at 4 a.m. Eastern time in New York, uh, so that by the time people woke up, it was already ready to publish, instead of us kind of getting our gears turning on it at 9 a.m. when people get to work, right? So for me, it was more a matter of being in the right place at the right time, um, but for advice that would actually be useful, um, I would say, um, you know, showing a keen interest um, in all, all sorts of regions, um, sharing the stories, interacting with other reporters, um, 
I, I think more than anything, having a expertise, uh, especially if you have it in a specific region, um, as opposed to being kind of a generalist, I think is important. Um, language skills is huge. There just aren't enough journalists that have language skills, especially um, you know if it happens to be a, a language that uh, <clears throat> is especially newsworthy. You know, Arabic, Chinese, uh, Mandarin specifically. Um, I, I think there are definitely big opportunities for that. Um, so, you know, it definitely will require some, some lucky breaks, but I, I think that those might help you at least, you know, get in the running. Excellent advice. So we do have a few more here. We'll kind of get through them. Um, <clears throat> I, this is sort of a big, big question, but what do you think makes a good interview? Hmm. Or a good interviewer, I guess, is actually the question, but it could, works either way. Um, I always prefer to have my interviews feel more like conversations. Um, I, I don't, I, I want you to forget that you're talking to a journalist, um, not in any ways that would, you know, entrap you, of course, but in a way that you would talk to a friend, you know. Um, <clears throat> obviously, I've just met these people, so they're not going to call me a friend, but um, you know, usually if you think about the conversations that you have with the friends, you don't go through a list of questions. Um, you are responding to what they tell you and you are kind of playing off of each other. A lot of times the most interesting comments aren't, you know, you, you most of the time you're not asking them questions. You say something, they say something, and then that gets them thinking about another thing. So, um, treating it more like a conversation, um, I think uh, I really make an effort to try to draw anecdotes out of people. Um, you know, oh, so this happened. Give me an example of, of, of why you felt that way, right? Um, let's see what else. Um, it's always nice if you can do it in person, but again, during COVID times, that's unfortunately less likely. Um, do you find yourself doing anything differently over Zoom or whatever? I mean, in terms of, um, I would say not really. Um, I think we're all a little awkward on Zoom, of course. You know, we all do this thing where, like I've been doing this entire time where I'm looking a little bit down instead of right up at the camera at you. Um, so yeah, it's, it's always a little bit more stunted when we're doing it here, but yeah, I, I think it's much more about the conversation and making them feel natural and making them feel comfortable. Um, let's get to a couple more and then we'll, we'll wrap things up so you can get some sleep. Um, when you jumped from the Patriot, uh, leader newspaper to an <clears> internet <throat> startup, it seemed like a huge gamble. What, was there something that inspired you to make that big leap and what would you, what advice would you give to maybe students in that kind of position? Yeah. So, um, so the, the site that I work for is called tbd.com. Um, at the time it got a lot of hype, uh, in kind of the, the trade press. Um, and it was, uh, created by a big company, All Britain that also owns Politico, um, to kind of try to make the Politico of local news. Um, that's a very much an oversimplification, an oversimplification of what they wanted to do. Um, but that was kind of the rough idea. Um, and so they brought in all these people from all around the country, and it was supposed to be a very, very, very uh, digital first operation in a way that most places really weren't at the time. Um, so that all of the people who were really focused on the internet at their various newspapers around the country kind of all assembled here for an all-star team of digital talent. So um, for me, it, it was really, really exciting. Like it was a risk for sure, but um, it was exciting being a part of people who were um, as focused on the internet as I was. Um, and so it was just exciting being a part of that. And, and I thought it was worth it. Um, there were a lot of weird political reasons that it didn't work out that it's not worth getting into. But um, yeah, I, I just, I thought it'd be fun and, and uh, it had me move to DC, which I also thought would be fun. So, um, it, at the time, did it feel like a risk? Or did you feel like you were gambling? Did it feel like? Not as much, no. I, I think that's actually a good point. Um, they did promise us a big runway that we did not get, um, again, for a variety of reasons. Um, which will happen. Um, I, but I think that even if it had been a, um, if we hadn't had that promised runway, um, yeah, I, I think under normal circumstances, it would have been a, a much tougher decision uh, in the sense of, you know, giving up stability versus uh, this exciting new thing, because there had been a lot of exciting new things that haven't worked. Um, but 
I think a lot of people would tell you that being a part of that um, is really exciting and, and really fun. And it lets you create this exciting new thing in your own image and, and work with like-minded people. And so there's a lot of good that can come out of that. Um, it's, you know, unfortunately almost a rite of passage that a lot of journalists have been laid off at some point in their career. Um, a lot of them recover or, or they move on to something new. Um, so it's not the end of the world if it happens. Um, but sometimes it's just, it's worth taking a leap. All right, two more questions and then we'll let you sure. go. Um, do you read the comments on your story? Mm -hmm. uh, I do, I do. Um, I, I, so this is uh, again, one of those moments times when I'll mention New York Times privilege in the sense that our, our comment section is pretty solidly different than any other comment section on the internet in the sense that we are extremely well staffed in a way that most places aren't able to do. And so that means that every single comment that you see on nytimes.com has been approved by a human editor. Um, and so you just don't get a lot of the just like random yelling that a lot of comment sections devolve into and just mean spiritedness that they usually devolve into. Um, partly because we have those, you know, those don't get in, we've created this culture where that's just kind of the expectation. Uh, and so, you know, I've seen the back end where all of the ones go in and there aren't that many people leaving the, the kind of garbage that you see in a lot of places. Um, it's actually a, an Instagram account that I highly recommend called, uh, oh shoot, what is it? It's uh, like NY Times cooking comments, something like that. If you Google around there, you'll find it. Um, but it's just weird comments specifically on our cooking pages. And uh, I'm not able to uh, perfectly describe it right now. Uh, again, it's late, but uh, it's, it's worth checking out. It's really funny. All right, I will take a look. I wrote a note. All right, last question uh, from Katie O'Toole. Is Twitter your helicopter on the building? No. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it. it I, I certainly, you know, David Carr was very famous and a, a legendary columnist, and so he had more Twitter followers than I did, for sure. I don't think I have quite enough. Uh, mine wouldn't be a, a helicopter; it'd be a little beanie cap on top of my head, more than anything. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is important to know that if I did move on to something new, um, that I I would potentially have that support, and that it it, it might be part of what helped me get something new. Um, but I'm not really looking for anything right now. So, and, and just, I mean, a little more seriously, I know you're not, maybe not looking for anything, but what do you see your five, 10, 20 year plan? Do you think about that or what? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, I, I don't know for sure. I, I would like to hang on for dear life at the times. Um, I, I've often described it as a bomb shelter where, you know, it, it may be the last place to employ a journalist if, if things go badly. Um, I, I love it there. I just, I, I love just the sense of mission, the coworkers, the, everything. It's, it's been a great home for me. Um, so I, I would like to stay there as long as possible. But in terms of my personal career, uh, I really don't know. I, I would love to have a good answer for that. Um, I like uh, refreshing myself. I like new challenges. Um, so I will probably just bounce around to new things every couple of years for as long as they let me. It doesn't seem like a bad plan to me. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. This was great. And I apologize for keeping you up so late. Um, Not a problem. Thank you for joining us. Someday, maybe we'll bring you back here when you're coming home to visit family. We'll do this again. That sounds great. All right. And thank you all for the questions and for uh, hanging out. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. We'll see you next week, I hope. All right. Good night, Dan. Good night.